Okay, um, so this class we're going to continue our discussion on the air pollution control methods. So starting from this class, we're going to learn about the single particle dynamics, but let's try to finish up uh, what we have learned from the um, size distribution discussions. Okay? Um, so basically, if we do a quick recap, uh, so our last class, we mainly talked about the log normal size distributions, and we show that there are quite many special properties of these size distributions, right? So the most straightforward method um, to show a log normal size distribution is not to show the distribution in this way, right? It's the way to show that in this semi-log plot. So if we show, if we can see a straight line here, then that means um, that, that follows log normal distribution. And for this plot, the y-axis is particle size, and the x-axis is the cumulative mass fraction below certain size, right? Um, so we also mentioned that uh, on this semi-log plot, we can get quite, ima quite many important parameters. For example, the DPG or the geometric mean. So people also use D50, mainly because um, DPG, if we plot it out, the, the um, um, geometric mean size, that's going to correspond to a cumulative mass fraction of 50%. Okay, it's always like this for log, log normal size distribution. So we can also get sigma G from the plot by um, finding out two more uh, data points. <clears throat> so just trying to confirm that you guys are familiar with this uh, concept. Let's do another quiz. Okay. So what is the cumulative mass fraction of a log normal distribution at dp equal to dpg multiplied by sigma g? Okay, so let's finish here. Uh, I guess for those who answered 50%, you guys probably haven't worked on the homework problems yet. Okay, so for a log normal size distribution, <clears throat> we already mentioned that. Um, so this is a result. So we already mentioned that uh, for a log normal size distribution, it's when dp is equal to dpg, you have 50%, okay? And for sigma g, that's normally above one, it has to be above one, okay? So if it's above one, and then we multiply that by dpg, then the cumulative fraction have to be larger than 50%, okay? So we can rule out 50% in the beginning, because that's when dpg, e, uh, it, well, that's when dp equal to dpg not multiplying sigma g, okay? So for log normal size distribution, when dpg equal, uh, dp equal to dpg multiplied by sigma g, uh, we show that that's always a constant. Okay? That depends on the error function. And that corresponds to the uh, mass fraction of 84.1%, okay? And when dp is equal to dpg divided by sigma g, then the cumulative mass fraction is 15.9%, all right? So any questions until now? So I really want you to um, um, get this understanding here because we can use that to simplify a lot of calculations regarding the size distributions. So um, yeah, let's just bear that in mind, okay? Uh, so this is the property of the uh, log normal size distribution. And um, so in your homework, I also wanted you to, to rework the example problem three, uh, 3.3. So that's 
a quite um, important uh, process when we evaluate the efficiency of certain PM removal devices. So for example, for this example problem, I'll just quickly guide you through this calculation process. Okay? So for a, um, let's say we somehow was able to measure the size distribution coming out of a coal-fired power plant, okay? Um, you know, coal combustion generates a lot of PM and we can use the impactor to measure the size distribution. Let's say this is what we get from the cascade impactor. Um, by showing it follows a straight line here, we can tell it follows log normal size distribution, all right? And then we can quite easily identify what is DPG from this plot, okay? So to find DPG or DP50 or D50, we just need to look for 50%. So by tracing here, we know that this is eight micrometers, okay? The geometric mean size is eight, eight micrometers. And then we can also find out what is sigma G because when DPG multiply by sigma G, when we find this size, the cumulative fraction should be 84.1%. So if we trace um, by using this plot here, we can find 84.1 should be somewhere here. And when the size is equal to DPG divided by sigma G, that's 14.1, uh, 15.1, 15.9, okay, 15.9. That should be somewhere here. Okay, so then we know that this size is approximately 60, uh, let's say 4.6, 4.6 micrometer. Okay, and regarding this size, it's approximately, say, 13 micrometer. So by using this relationship here, we can calculate out what is DPG and what is sigma G, okay? So this is how we use the semi-log plot. And then let's say for um, what this problem asks us is regarding the, um, to, um, the particle capture efficiency of a device, okay? So let's say that um, the, um, the size distribution shown here is characteristic uh, characteristic of the particulates, right? So it wants us to predict the overall efficiency of a device that has the following efficiency versus uh, size, okay? So what this device tells us is that if we're treating particles with very large size, let's say 30, 50 micrometer, it has 99% capture efficiency. If we talk about very small size, zero to two micron, just have 10% efficiency. And this actually applies for a lot of PM control devices because those devices can easily capture very small, uh, very large particles, but they're less efficient when they capture very small particles, okay? So if we have a size distribution that looks like this, how do we calculate the overall efficiency? So what we need to do is first find out what is the mass fraction of particles in each size range, right? Because we first need to identify what is the mass in here, and then we can calculate the overall efficiency. It's not like we, we can just uh, combine these all together because smaller particles, um, although their filtration efficiency is lower, uh, their mass is also smaller, right? Because um, overall, the, uh, the overall efficiency have to consider all different size ranges. So what we need to do is to use this plot. Let's say we're trying to uh, identify these particle sizes, right? Two, four, six, if we just look on this side, 10, 14, 20, 30, and 50, okay? So let's go back to this plot. What we need to do is we'll find out these data points, okay? First, let's say two micrometer is here, right? And then four, six, 10, 14, let's, say, let's still use this point, 
20, 30, and 50. So there's really no need to plot out 50 because you see that the efficiency is all, I mean, the, the, the mass fraction is almost 100%. Right? Let's say, let's assume that it's somewhere here. Okay. So based on this and uh, these data points, we can first find out what is the cumulative mass fraction until this size, right? So here, let's say the cumulative mass fraction until two micrometer, this is gonna be say point, point 0.5, okay? And then at four, this is 10. At six, this is 30, right? At uh, 10 micrometer, this is 68, right? And at 14, this is 85. So, so on and so forth, okay? And then we can calculate what is the mass fraction between these sizes. We just need to use this number minus this number here, right? Because we're talking about cumulative mass fraction. And to get the mass fraction of particles within this size range, we just need to take the difference, right? So we can start to, um, let's say, we add another column. Let's say this is the mass fraction within this size range. So we know that zero to two micrometer, it accounts 0.5%, right? Two to four, it accounts 10 minus 0 .5, 0 0.5, that's 9.5%. Four to six, that's, uh, that's 30% minus 10%, right? That's 20%. 10 to six, that's 38%, so on and so forth, okay? So basically, we're calculating what is the mass fraction within this size range, and that's done by taking the difference between the cumulative mass fraction, right? So this mass fraction is until six micrometer, that's 30%. And this fraction is until four micrometer, that's 10%. So because of that, the mass fraction between four to six micrometer, that's gonna be the difference between these two values, right? So that's how we find out what is the mass fraction within each size range, right? so on and so forth. And finally, when you add all of them together, they should be equal to 100%, right? And then to calculate the overall efficiency of this device, we just need to multiply this number by this number, right? This number by this number. This is the corresponding efficiency, and here is the corresponding mass fraction, right? So we'll multiply these together. And then finally add them all to find out what is the overall efficiency. Okay. Uh, any questions? Anything not clear? So in your homework, you're gonna go through this problem again. And um, I think you can refer to your textbook because um, there are solutions, right? So it's just going to guide you through these processes and, and we're going to use this concept to learn about other uh, PM removal devices because really the removal efficiency is based on size. Larger particles they have larger efficiencies, smaller particles they have smaller efficiencies. All right. Um, so now let's spend some time on the term project. Okay, so I promise that I'm going to talk about the term project during the third week. Uh, so you can also find out the team assignment on Canvas now, um, and I'll discuss that later, okay? So um, what we're trying to do in this term project is basically to design a air pollution control device for a coal-fired power plant. It's because um, uh, we have discussed that coal combustion is a process that generates all different types of primary air pollutants. Have um, PM, you have sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, lead, carbon monoxide, except for ozone. Okay? It generates a lot of these air pollutants. And to 
Um, of course, we need the electricity coming out of the coal fire power plant, but if we don't put any control there, it's just going to be a strong hotspot. No one wants to live nearby the power plant anymore. Okay. So uh, what we're trying to do is to design a air pollution control device that can get rid of these PM, these acidic gases, right? And um, we want to design the scale of uh, these systems, calculate, and also to estimate what is the cost, both for the capital cost for constructing these devices and also for, um, for operating these devices, like daily uh, cost or yearly cost so on and so forth, okay? So the system we're trying to deal with is a 300 megawatt uh, power plant, okay? And then um, let's say we're trying to construct this coal-fired power plant and you can try to look for the definitions of supercritical coal-fired power plant. So basically this is a technique to generate more electricity or enhance the combustion efficiency. So uh, we introduced an example problem, which has the um, coal fire problem, where the coal fire power plant has a combustion efficiency of 40%, okay? So the supercritical coal fire power plant generally have higher efficiencies. And you can try to look for some literatures about why the efficiency is higher, right? And what is the approximate value for that? So you can use that efficiency number to calculate how much coal we're burning every day, right? We, we went through that process in the problem. We just need to find out what is the heating value for our coal. So let's say we're trying to build this uh, 300 megawatt uh, coal-fired power plant, and your job is to design our particle control system that takes into the fact that um, we're using the dry flue gas desulfurization. We mentioned that coal fire power plant or the fossil fuel combustion generates sulfur dioxide, right? And the um, flue gas desulfurization is a technique to remove the sulfur dioxide, basically to neutralize the sulfur dioxide, right? So we'll discuss this concept um, after the midterm when we talk about sulfur dioxide, okay? So, but if you're interested, you can start to uh, refer to the textbook regarding the mechanism and calculations for these processes. So basically what happens is that um, coal fire combustion generate particles, but in addition to, the, to those particles, we're also injecting these um, solids, which are um, composed of lime or chona, so they're going to neutralize with these uh, sulfur dioxide. So we further add in particles into the coal fire power plant to neutralize acidic gases. So um, because of that, our particle control system have to remove the extra PM from this technique, okay? Uh, let's assume that the power plant uses the Eastern K Kentucky coal. Um, so a, uh, a fact sheet, it basically uh, shows the, um, the chemical composition and the heating value of these uh, Eastern Kentucky coal. You can try to refer to that to find out what is the, so to basically calculate what is the mass of coal that we have to burn every day to generate this amount of energy, okay? So also regarding the emission, we have to rely on the mass rules. So that's another uh, EPA document showing what is the limitation, what is the standard for these air pollutant emission for coal-fired power plants, all right? Um, so you guys are divided into four groups, and each group is going to um, basically design a separate system, um, a, a different set of system, okay? Um, so you're going to use different PM removal devices, right? Um, Backhaus or, or electrostatic precipitator, we're going to cover that in the future, in the next few weeks. And also, um, you're going to use either lime or chona to neutralize acidic gases, okay? So for example, the, the key questions that you have to answer are, uh, what are the particle concentration? What is particle concentration? How much of these solids you have to inject to neutralize the acidic gases? What is the flow, flow rate? What is the operating conditions? And also what are the, um, let's say the dimension, right? 
So if you can, if you can use um, AutoCAD to um, draw a sketch of the device that you're um, designing, then that would be better, right? For example, dilute, uh, dimension and also cost associated with building up these devices. So there are assumptions that you can um, take to solve this problem or to simplify the calculation. So for example, not all of the PM are emitted from the stack, right? So 82% um, of the flash actually deposit in our combustion chamber. So we can directly reuse them. They don't suspend as the form of particular matter. So only 28%. Uh, only 28% uh, will get emitted, right? We just need to control that fraction of the particles. And uh, we don't need to um, worry about mercury for here, but if you're interested, you can inject some activated carbon to solve this problem, okay? So we mentioned about sulfur dioxide, but actually sulfur dioxide is not the only acidic gas being generated. So there are also sulfur trioxide and uh, uh, hydrogen chloride, right? So you can calculate that based on what is the composition of this Eastern Kentucky coal, because uh, we know that coal is com composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, right? And we know that there are also trace amounts of this chloride, let's say sodium, magnesium, so on and so forth. So basically what happens is that carbon finally will convert to carbon dioxide. Let's assume that chloride, all of them gets converted into hydrogen chloride, right? Um, hydrogen converts into uh, water, and then these um, metallic, metallic elements, they will just get converted into PM because they will not exist in gas, right? Um, so let's say we can use stoichiometry. Basically, if we know the composition of the coal particles, we can calculate what is the composition of the flue gas. And we can also assume a typical proportion of the acidic gas emission rates. So I, one thing I forgot to mention is that to calculate sulfur dioxide, you can also find out what is the composition of sulfur in the coal. The sulfur will get converted into sulfur dioxide. Right? So we can calculate what is the uh, emission rate from the coal. So once we know that, we can use this assumption here to further calculate what is the um, amount of hydrogen chloride and sulfur trioxide getting emitted because here is the uh, proportion of all of these gas species, right? So there are four teams, four groups. Um, team one will design a, um, so basically here, the first segment, that's the PM removal device, okay? So it, it's composed of a backhouse, which is a filter, okay? So filter with pre-cleaner, pre-cleaner is a cyclone, and we'll talk about that maybe next week, okay? Um, backhouse with, um, so the second team also use the same PM removal device, except that the, um, the sulfur, uh, or sulfur dioxide removal is different. One is using trona. Trona is mainly composed of, um, composed of uh, sodium carbonate. There are some sodium bicarbonate as well, okay? So lime is mainly composed of calcium oxide, maybe calcium hydroxide as well. So uh, you should refer to the um, actual the database regarding what are the composition of these solids being injected into the system to neutralize the ga uh, acidic gas species, right? So team three and team four are going to use the electrostatic precipitator, but we also uh, will include a, a pre-cleaner, all right? So each of the group will cover a different set of air pollutant removal device, right? So that uh, you guys don't duplicate the work, okay? But um, in terms of, let's say, in terms of a lot of basics, let's say uh, how much coal are being burned, right? How much sulfur dioxide are being generated, they should be quite similar. So finally, when you um, evaluate each other's work, uh, try to find out or try to identify whether those values are um, in the same order magnitude when you solve this problem. For example, if one group um, says that the emission of the sulfur dioxide is one kilogram per day, while the other is one ton per day, then you know a there's a problem, right? 
solved by too many orders of magnitude. Uh, so here is the team assignment. You can um, refer to your name. I hope there are no, uh, I didn't double count anyone here. So let's say, try to get in contact with your team members uh, earlier rather than later, because um, it's easier that you uh, distribute the work well, and then also present, present the work well. Um, so try to properly assign the tasks. I noticed that uh, this year quite many students um, registered my class because last year I think there are just um, 23 or 24 students and this time we have 32 students. Uh, what that means is that you're going to have more uh, team members so uh, you can collaborate with, with each other, right? So you should work uh, together and then since you have more members you can double check the values. Right? So if you just assign, let's say, the calculation of the um, mass of the coal to one person, and then that one person did some mistake, then uh, all the other members will be affected, right? Because the downstream PM removal or sulfur dioxide removal largely depends on how much coal you burn. So try to assign, try, try to assign uh, um, the same problem to multiple people. So you can make sure that you're doing the right thing. Okay, so for example, I remember um, last year or the year before, um, there was a group saying that their PM removal device, I think it's a electrostatic precipitator, has to have a dimension of 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer. Okay, so uh, we never see a coal-fired power plant covering lar that large of an area. There's no way we, we can build this system. So it has to be, um, there are some minor uh, calculations. Maybe the numbers are off, or off by like 10 to the third or 10 to the fifth order of magnitude, okay? So um, try to make sure that the, um, let's say engineer-wise, these numbers make sense, okay? But also try not to um, fit your answer to this problem, okay? You, I mean, uh, you get what you calculated. Uh, so instead of, uh, let's say, don't try to bend your calculation so that it fits to the actual problem, all right? So for this term project, um, it's going to compose of two parts, okay? So you have, um, you have to submit a final report that has to be a detailed description of all the components of your uh, uh, pollutant removal devices. And also, uh, there are going to be presentations that's going to happen at the very end of our class in December, December 7th and 9th. Um, so each group will present 15 to 20 minutes about your device. So each class we have two groups presenting and others can ask questions. Okay, so you have to create each other's project. Okay, and um, of course my score also matters. Otherwise I think everyone will get full score, right? So, uh, um, and uh, after that, we'll have the final exam, all right? So any questions about the term project right now? So I think um, you guys can probably start with a few very uh, uh, basic questions regarding this project, right? We mentioned that um, all the uh, downstream calculations on PM, on sulfur dioxide are dependent on the mass of coal that we burn, right? So right now you can try to start to uh, refer to the, um, the document that I uploaded to Canvas regarding the composition of the Eastern Kentucky coal. You can find out what is the heating value, right? You can find out what are the chemical composition there to uh, basically do a calculation of the mass of coal, coal being burned. And then um, we have already done this practice before. And you can also calculate what is the sulfur dioxide emission amount. So just try to make sure that uh, your calculation makes sense here. Okay. So as we further progress in our class, you'll get more information regarding each type of the removal device. All right. Um, because I think based on my, um, I always get some complaints um, in the uh, course evaluation saying that the uh, projects are um, taking a lot of time at the end of the semester because you guys don't have time, have to also prepare for finals. 
So I would say uh, it's better that you start earlier, right, to focus on these problems. And also you get better prepared. Um, yeah, so that's all on the term project. So this class, we are going to learn some new concepts regarding the PM. Okay, so we're going to talk about the uh, single particle dynamics. Uh, so when we, when we mention about single particle dynamics, it's mainly uh, trying to do force balance or force analysis on these particles. So we mentioned in our last class uh, that from that uh, from then on, all the particles are going to be spherical in our class. Okay, so we're talking about spherical particles. So we have to first know what are the types of forces on these particles, okay? So an example force, let's say is gravity. So we know that gravity is just mg, the mass multiplied by, by the acceleration, right? The mass can be calculated by volume multiplied by, by the density of the particle and then the acceleration. And then we know that the volume is pi over six dp third rho particle and g. Okay, so this is our uh, gravity. And there are also buoyancy. Right? So buoyancy is quite similar to gravity. It's just we have to replace the particle density by the fluid density. Let's say the air, either the air density or the water density, right? So this is a buoyancy. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about electrostatic force as well. Okay. And we know that uh, it can be calculated by QE, right? So the Q is the number of charges. And the E here is the electric field strings. Okay. Uh, so the electrostatic force is kind of a special force if we compare to the first two, because uh, the first two largely depends on how large the particle is, right? So larger particles will have larger gravity, or larger buoyancy, but the electrostatic force just depends on what is the number of charges and what is the electrostatic field strength. It's not dependent on the particle phys uh, physical properties, right? So there's also a force called the thermophoretic force. So what happens is that uh, uh, when a particle is placed in a temperature field, let's say this is hot, this is cold, so the molecules surrounding the particle are going to have different um, moving speeds or kinetic velocity here, kinetic energy here. So on the hot side, the, the molecules are going to move with a higher speed, right? So they, they have higher velocity, more momentum. So they're going to bombard or collide with the molecule, uh, or collide with the particle here. Well, well, on the cold side, the molecules are uh, less kinetic. They have lower velocity, right? Smaller velocity. So their kinetic energy is going to be lower. So this is going to give it, the particles a net uh, momentum or net force from the hot side to, to the cold side. Okay, so we call this thermophoretic force. So there are also all other types of forces. If we place, let's say, the magnet um, in a mag magnetic field, particle for charged particles, we also have the Lorentz force, right? Uh, depending on how many charges are there on the particle. So for all these types of forces, there really dependent on the external fields. Okay, so the particle movement or the force on the particle really depends on um, what happens for the um, external condition. Let's say um, 
on the Earth, we know that the acceleration is around 10, right? But if we place our particle on Moon, the gravity will be different, right? Because the external field is different, right? So all of these forces are dependent on, on what is the external condition. But there is one type of force that depends on the internal or the intrinsic property of the particles. And that force is called the drag force. Okay. So what the drag force does is the drag force always tries to constrain the movement of a particle. Or we should say the relative movement. Okay, so um, this happens when, let's say, uh, we have a fluid, right? And then there's a particle. Let's say we just emit some particle in the air, all right? So if, as long as there is a relative velocity, so this is VR, R means relative, okay? As long as the relative velocity isn't zero, so the velocity between the particle and the ambient fluid is not zero, there's always drag force. Okay, so the drag force tries to basically reduce the relative velocity of the particles in any fluid. Okay. Um, so we say that the drag force is intrinsic to the particle, but um, do they really exist, right? So it's kind of difficult to, um, to say that or to quantify what is a drag force. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys have, any of you have done the uh, skydiving, probably not. But you guys probably watch the videos of skydiving, right? So whenever people jump out of the plane, you see there's a strong um, wind, right? Blowing directly on the person, right? So that force is a drag force, right? So drag force also applies on uh, all different, actually uh, applies on all different types of objects. For example, the rain droplets. So when we form rain droplets high above the ground, when the rain drops down, it also has a drag force, which constrains its movement. So we can do a very simple calculation to show how important drag force is, because if there's no drag force on the rain droplet, we're just, it's like uh, raining bullets from the sky, okay? We'll show um, what is it, how much the drag force actually play a role here. So let's say um, here's our ground, and then we have uh, clouds that's above us. Right, let's assume that this distance is around two kilometer. This is actually a quite reasonable um, assumption. Normally, the clouds above us, the raining clouds above us, is between one to two kilometers, okay? Let's say we form rain droplets here, and then they start to settle down, okay? And of course, they have to settle down by gravity. There's no electric field, and they don't carry any charges, right? So if we do a force an, uh, analysis on these rain droplets, we know that there is gravity, right? So on the counterbalance part, we know there is buoyancy. But if we compare the relative magnitude of the gravity and buoyancy, we know that it depends on the, what is the density of the particle, right, and the fluid. For the air, the density is one kilogram per meter cube. Well, for water, that's 1,000, right? So we can just basically ignore this buoyancy here, right? So let's assume that there is no drag force, and we'll see what happens, okay? So if there is no drag force, then the particle are going to keep accelerating, or the raindrop is going to keep accelerating, right? We know that by uh, second Newton's law, Newton's second law, we know that ma is going to be equal to mg, right? So m multiplied by dv dt is going to be mg here. So we can cancel out the m, right? We know that the acceleration is g here. So we can calculate v, or the velocity of the raindrop is going to be gt. So basically, after one second, the velocity will be 10 meters per, per second. After 10 seconds, it'll be, um, it'll be uh, around 100 meters per second, okay? 
So then we can calculate what is the distance of the raindrop that it has traveled. So the distance is going to be one over two gt square, right? And we know that this total distance here is one uh, is two kilometer. That's two thousand. All right. So let's assume that g is ten meter per second square. Right, we know that t square is going to be 4,000 divided by 10, which is 400. Then t is the square root of 400, 20 seconds. Okay, so if there is no uh, drag force, it needs 20 seconds for the raindrop to fall from the cloud to the ground. Okay. And then we can calculate what is the final velocity of the raindrop. So this is the final, Vf is the final. Then that's gonna be Gt, which is 20, which is 10 multiplied by 20, that's 200 meter per second. Okay, so this is a very, very fast speed, okay? So just to do a comparison, and the typical, the bullets, have a velocity of, of around 400 meter per second, okay? So, um, I mean, although it's half of the speed, it's already very fast, okay? And if we just uh, go outside and the raindrops have this high of an efficiency, there's no way we can walk outside. It's, it's uh, going to be very painful if we, if we go outside, right? So the actual velocity of the raindrops so people have measured that, it's around 10 meter per second. Okay. So because of that, we know that the drag force must have played a very important role here. Right? There have to be some force that's dragging the particles from uh, flying with this high speed. All right. So um, basically this is where we know that the drag force play an important role. And applies for all the objects or all the particles that has a relative velocity compared to the ambient fluid, okay? So then how do we quantify this drag force, right? Um, so actually the first efforts that's trying to um, calculate or try to quantify this drag force has to date back to a few hundred years ago. So um, actually Newton created the equation. I know that he was probably very busy creating all different uh, equations. So he also did some calculation on the drag force. So the equation was created around uh, 1680, right? So the drag force can be calculated by one over two rho v r square AP and CD. Okay, it's just a few parameters here. So let's explain what they are, okay? So the rho here is the fluid density. So maybe I should just directly write rho f here, okay? This is the fluid density. Vr, as we have introduced, this is the relative velocity. Okay, so let's say that we're going to use the, show the units here as well. So it's going to be kilogram per meter cube. This is meter per second. Okay, so AP is the cross section area, right? So if you have the, uh, let's say we have two objects, right? One is a, um, a smaller sphere, one is a larger sphere, okay? one is a larger particle then because their cross-section area is different, their drag force will also be different, right? So AP here is the cross-section area. And this is calculated by pi over four dp square, because we assume that all the particles we're going to deal with are spherical particles, right? This is how we calculate the uh, cross-section area here. And um, 
that's going to ca carry a unit of meter square, right? And then CD is just the drag constant or drag coefficient. Okay, it carries a unit of one, it doesn't have any unit here. Okay, so if we directly look at this equation, it makes a lot of sense, right? So let's say the drag force is proportional to the um, square of the uh, relative velocity. You know that drag force basically tries to constrain the relative movement of the particle and the fluid, right? So the higher the relative velocity, then the larger the drag force. So that makes sense, right? Um, it's also proportional to the fluid density. So let's say we're trying to place a, uh, we're trying to move a particle in the air, and we're also trying to move a particle in water. We know that the drag force in water is going to be higher. And that depends on the um, density of the fluid, right? So it's also proportional to the cross-section area. So we explained that. Uh, it also makes sense, okay? So one thing that we need to pay attention is that the drag constant here, or the drag coefficient, the drag coefficient is not a constant. So this is the uh, important thing when we try to understand this equation. So I think at that time, people don't have the techniques to uh, explain what really this number is, right? It's not like uh, right now we can use all different types of uh, cameras to capture the movement of the particles. So at that time, uh, the additional term, people just use a, uh, a coefficient to represent that. And later you can find out that uh, it depends on, um, mainly depends on the Reynolds number or the movement of the uh, particles, okay? So I mentioned that CD, it's not a constant, actually CD is a function of the Reynolds number. I would know that the Reynolds number is calculated by VR, rho F, dP, divided by mu. Okay, you learn this parameter in your fluid dynamics, fluid mechanics class, okay? So the mu here is the dynamic viscosity, Okay, it has a unit of Newton second divided by meter square. Okay, and under standard condition, let's say in the air, so this mu has a value of 1.8 multiplied by 10 to the minus five Newton second divided by meter square. Okay, this is a typical value that we can use. Okay, so, um, you can see that the drag force, I mean, probably at that time, if we travel back to that time, if we do a few observations, we can also draw similar conclusions, right? These are the parameters um, that directly impact the drag force. It's just the drag uh, coefficient is the thing that we cannot really predict well. So we mentioned that drag coefficient depends on the Reynolds, num Reynolds number, and this uh, figure here is also in your textbook. Figure 3.6 actually plot out what is the uh, relationship between the drag coefficient, CD, and the Reynolds number. So one thing you can notice is that actually uh, in the large range, let's say when the Reynolds number is above 1000 in this range, the CD is almost a constant. Okay. So this simplifies a lot of calculations here. But um, basically, if the Reynolds number is very large, let's say much larger than 100, okay? That also means that the particle size is very large. Okay, we mentioned that Reynolds number is dependent or proportional to the particle size. So if the Reynolds amount number is very large, then the particle size will also be very large, right? So some of them can settle very quickly. But when we talk about PM, that's suspended in the air. We know that generally the particle size is very small, okay? Much smaller, let's say, than one, uh, one, than one millimeter, okay? So those will f actually fall into the sm smaller Reynolds number range. And we have to plug in different equations to calculate the drag force. And that's why people um, invented new equations 
to calculate this draft. So we are going to cover that in our next class, right? Uh, so that's all for this class. So we basically introduced the draft force, and then we went over the um, further the uh, the uh, size distributions and also the um, term projects. So let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you.